And that's also another way of 20xing your performance because like if your energy is low, you can increase it. If your energy is too high and you get a little anxious, you can bring it back down. If you're contracted in your thinking and you want to expand your thinking, there's exercises for that too. So you're literally like you can use breath to 20x your performance. Welcome back, everybody. We're joined today by Michael Osterlank. Michael is a seasoned psychotherapist, a human system optimization coach, and an entrepreneur. And if you'd like to find out how you can 20x yourself and your own productivity in your life, you're going to want to stick around for this one. Michael, thank you for joining us today. We're so excited to have you. Hey, Jason. Uh, Anthony, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, welcome, Michael. Uh, so, Michael, that is uh, an interesting uh, background you have there. I'm very curious to know how you get into something like human system optimization. Man, so if you can, if we can go back in a time machine about 44 years or so, that's cool. Yeah, we'd love to. Yeah, yeah cool, good, because that's where this kind of my story begins as far as I can recall. Um, when I was around nine, and I can tell you a really funny story preceding this, but I had a really good therapist. Her name is Pat Lawson. And uh, she taught me biofeedback, she taught me guided imagery, she taught me meditation, she got me the martial arts. And that just set up the whole space for me to go like, wow, you know, like we, we, we can be self-mastered, we can learn to regulate ourselves, we can do higher consciousness, you know, we can extend our capabilities way beyond what we think we can do. And I would say she planted seeds back in 1979, a, a long time ago. And it's kind of funny because I think back about the technology because she literally taught me biofeedback, so we had machines. But 1979, like nothing compared to like the technology we have today. So you can just imagine I was learning how to breathe and manage my nervous system. And, and the more relaxed I got, a balloon would rise. And if I got stressed out, the balloon would fall. That, that's as exciting as the technology was in 1979. But, you know, for a, for a nine-year-old, that was pretty, pretty awesome. That was the beginning of those explorations. That sounds like some intense uh, exercises for a nine-year-old. Uh, what was that like, if you can remember? Well, and, and let me proceed to tell you a little story prior to seeing Pat Lawson, if that's okay with you, because it kind of shows the, the mindset that I had. You can call it kind of I don't know, an obnoxious mindset for a nine-year-old, but my mom took me to see a psychiatrist literally right before we saw Mrs. Lawson. And we, I spent the whole hour with him talking, da 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 and At the end of the session, I turned to her and I said, he's fat, he smokes, he can't help himself, how can he help me? And I walked out of the room. Now, I'm really fortunate that my mom <laughs> agreed with me and did not make me see the psychiatrist ever again, thank God, because in 1979, they just would have put you on medication. Probably still today, they still put you on medication. But she, she found Mrs. Lawson. And Mrs. Lawson then, like I said, opened up these doors for all these different things. And I loved it. Like, you know, my, your question was like, you know, my experiences doing these kind of things. And I just thought it was the coolest thing to be able to regulate my own nervous system. I mean, I didn't have the language, but I got to experience what it was like and the power of the mind through guided imagery. She taught me guided imagery as well. And then, you know, introduction to the martial arts and the kind of the Bushido warrior tradition and Bruce Lee, of course, because this is 1979. You know, that was just, it was just, as a, as a little kid, it was awesome. I mean, and I was dealing with real problems. It was challenging. It was hard, but like just those explorations were really fun, I'll say. Would you recommend that sort of coaching, just generally speaking, for nine-year-olds? Like, do you think this is a pattern worth emulating? I say, that's a great question. And I think self-regulation is, is a really important thing. And we naturally learn how to do it over time, some less well than others, obviously, because we can see adults who can't regulate themselves well. And I think with the technology we have today and all the biohacking tools and stuff like that, I, I, I would say, yeah, there's no reason why especially kids loving technology and we can have a conversation about the benefits of using technology, but even just self-awareness and self-management without technology would be a great practice for any human being, but especially kids, especially these days with kind of the immediate gratification and the dopamine rushes and they're all on social media all the time. And they can't really regulate themselves well. And we also find that empathy, I think is reducing over time as well. So, you know, those, those things can be counteracted to a certain extent by learning to manage one's nervous system towards higher ends. So, yes, the answer to your question, Anthony, is I think it'd be really good for kids to learn how to manage themselves and learn to use their mind differently than most of them are presently. Yeah, I'm thinking about 
the prevalence of things like ADHD in kids these days. And I'm wondering if like tools like, you know, being able to self-regulate and also, um, you know, attention, I think is a big one, but that's what you, you already said with the instant gratification. These are all like, if we do nothing, we sort of see what's happening. So it like takes intentional action to bring us back. Can, can I can I speak to the ADD if you don't mind? Please, guys. Yeah. So actually, I, I you, over the years given talks on ADD and and I'll for for parents and families and stuff and and I'll say this before you put your child on medication and I can't speak to, to your specific issues and dynamics at your home and what's going on in the, in the child. So this is not this is broad generalization, not specific to any individual child and family. But I'd say like there are at least five or six or seven other factors one needs to look at: diet, nutrition. I mean, we just feed our kids crap and we know that some of these things can have neuro neurotoxic effects and behavioral effects, lack of exercise, lack of sunlight, you know, the, you know just cir circadian biology, basically lack of connection, o overuse of technology, uh, whether it's social media or, or YouTube or whatever, whatever the things are that people are engaged in iPhones, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, all those things are really important, but also like what's the school school experience like? You know, maybe as an institution, it's not appropriate for a certain subset of the kids, or I would actually say most kids, but subset of the kids, it's just, there's a, a mix match, not a good fit. And then the last thing I always say is, is you know, that we need as a, as a species, a subset of our species to always seek novelty. We get bored really easily. And I think ADD, for some, representative of those kids who we need in our culture, not to be drugged out of existence and controlled, but like bored and easily and seeking novelty all the time because that's how our culture evolves. So I'd say like, you know, before you throw your kids on drugs, look at all those op options to explore first. Yeah, certainly the harder route, right? Like giving somebody a pill is an easy, is the easy path, but the, but the payoff is like why, why we do it. So how did your experiences when you were nine years old end up with you now helping other people through therapy and coaching? So it was actually kind of fun. I had two paths in life, a, a private one where I explored like alternative philosophies and nutrition and fitness and spirituality, everything we just kind of talked about. And then I was born and raised in DC and I had this flight plan for like uh, working for the government, military, all that stuff like that. That was a kind of a plan. But while it's kind of on that path, it's on the private side, I mean, I would, I remember in high school, I'd, I'd hypnotize friends, and I'd teach them how to do autonomic relaxation techniques and progressive muscle relaxation techniques. But there's one experience that I had, which kind of like, Ooh, wait, I probably shouldn't do this because I'm not really qualified because I had a friend who I did do one of the guided imagery things with, and his father was died from a, a napalm exposure in Vietnam. So he, and he was really traumatized and like he, things rose in him while we're doing this guided meditation. And I'm like, Oh shit, I'm not qualified to do this stuff. Like I so it was like the last time, I did that as a teenager because I'm like, yeah, I'm not, I don't know how to deal with this stuff. And then um, I was in the middle of an MBA program after college I, on my path to work for the government and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, man, a good friend of mine since I was elementary school was murdered. Um, and then about a month later, a teacher committed suicide. And it caused me to have a great night of the soul or a dark night of the soul kind of reflecting on life. And the realization I had was like, hey, MBA was easy. It's fine. I had no interest in it. I had no interest in business. I had no interest in the, kind of the management uh, uh, philosophies. The only thing that was interesting to me was psychology and, and philosophy in, this, in terms of psychology and spirituality and stuff like that. And then I, re I realized like, wow, I, I should do what I really want to do, which is explore this psychological dimensions of human beings and optimization of health and wellness. And so I, I switched from the MBA and I moved off to actually left the left coast, went to California. West Coast and uh, did all my graduate work. So, you know, it was it, it was the murder and the suicide, which caused me to rethink and realize like this private interest is really my full interest and I want to turn into a public or a work related interest. Can, I wanted to ask you a question about the the hypnosis thing, if I could for a second. Sure. Um, I'm like cautiously skeptical and I'm kind of curious how you would describe how it works. Okay, so if you get someone really relaxed, depending on what technology you might use to get them relaxed, it seems to me that they have much more easy access to unconscious processes. 
kind of like their ego is a little bit more relaxed, less defended, and they can experience a much broader um, array of bodily experiences, whether the thoughts, imagery, sensations, sounds, colors, textures, feelings inside the body, energetics and stuff. And part of the got got part of the, the part of the hypnosis process is like opening them up to whatever's arising in their system and then exploring it. And or if you want to change a behavior, you're inculcating them with the belief system. Like you're changing the belief system. So you can actually they're relaxed or more open, they're less defended against like because we, we tend to defend ourselves against information that's contrary to how we believe about ourselves. But if you're really relaxed in that kind of state, you're more open. So the, the hyp hypnotherapist can then you know, kind of put into your consciousness or your unconsciousness uh, beliefs that are different than what you've carried in you or, or not necessarily different than sometimes they're different than like, I'm a, you know, I'm confident versus I'm lacking confident, but it could also be like, uh, you don't like smoking, which you like, you want to quit smoking or something like that. You hate cigarettes. Like the taste of cigarettes makes you want to throw up, you know, so they can inculcate those kind of messages into your unconscious mind. So when you're operating in the world, you don't even think about like, oh, I hate cigarettes. You're like, oh my God, I can't fucking stand cigarettes. They're disgusting. I'm never going to smoke again. Or like, you know, I watch my diet or I walk around and feel like, wow, I'm feeling a lot more confident. So those are kind of one way to consider, at least from my understanding of how that might work. Does that make sense, Anthony? Yeah, it totally makes sense. Um, and I'm wondering like the, the lasting effects of that. So like, is it rewiring your brain in some way? Is it like... Yeah, how how does it stick? Well, so I'll, I'll give you an example for, for me personally. Um, I had a friend of mine do this for me two years ago on cow on coffee. He's like, I was like, yeah, I want to, I, I need a break from coffee. I was a tea drinker for the longest time. Then I got married and switched to coffee, and I'm like, I want to go back to tea. And but I want your help. So he did. The, he did a very similar process with me. And the next thing I know, I go to the coffee shop. The next day, I have no interest in coffee. And I'm like, this is like literally like, and I have enough self-awareness to say I'm not bullshit myself. I'm like, wow, like I literally don't. And the whole, it's not just a lack of interest in coffee, but the whole like um, experience around coffee, which I, I think mostly drives people to do their habits is like the experience around the thing. It was gone. And I was almost like in a neutral space. I'm like, oh, it's an opening to create something new for myself. And I started drinking tea again. And I did it for like three months. And I was literally like, like, I want, like, I want to want coffee, but I don't. It's really strange. And then after a while, I'm going, okay, I've, I've done the detox of what I want to do. No caffeine, stomach stuff, whatever. So I had them undo the, the, the programming. So I can speak from personal experience, at least for those three months. It just, it was gone. Like whatever he did worked for me to like not think about wanting ever coffee. And then he's able to kind of reprogram me. So, you know, is there a lot of science behind that? I'd be curious like what, how they've explored that, how they understand it in terms of how the brain and the nervous system works. But anecdotally, <laughs> it worked for me. So I want to ask you now, you know, what are you up to these days? What's your current passion venture? Uh... Yeah, so three things. Um, I work with individuals and I have a very particular six month long program that I teach. And it's a kind of human optimization. It's 20 x in your performance resilience training and it and, and i'll explain it to you later if you're interested but it, there's a physiological psychological social and environmental component to it so that's i spend a good amount of time working with clients on that i work with couples i'm trained as, in, as a psychotherapist a marriage and family therapist so although i've been practicing as a coach since 2000 or so i still work with couples i just don't do it under my license and then i also co-lead a resilience group with a buddy of mine jc Flick, a former army ranger and it's resilience 2.0 and I can tell you about that because it's interesting to compare and contrast what we would call 1.0 to 2.0, if you'd like. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. I'd love to hear that. Okay. So, you know, JC Glick is a former Army Ranger, as I said, and we attract a lot of military guys in our pre-interviews for this men's group. And JC would joke around like, hey, this is not Resilience 1.0. This is not like Jocko Wilnick waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning, taking a picture of your watch and lifting heavy weights or doing a hundred mile run before breakfast like a David Goggins. All that's great, like physical capacity building, testing one's metal, all that's wonderful. But for us, 2.0 is actually more of emotional mental resilience. Are you capable of sitting in your own shit, like your own experience without seeking distraction? Most of us, if not all of us, we have means of distracting ourselves, whether it's porn or drugs or alcohol or work or television, Netflix, you know, whatever it is that we do do to distract ourselves from our own experience. We teach men how to sit in their own experience 
as painful as it is, because that's resilience. Not only sitting your own experience, but like, can you sit when your spouse is messy? She's having a rough day. And like, you're like, oh, I feel uncomfortable. She's uncomfortable, so I want to fix her. So I don't want to feel uncomfortable. It's like, no, can you just sit with her, whatever she's experiencing, find out what she needs from you. Maybe she does want to fix the solution. Maybe she just wants to talk about whatever's going on for her. Find out and then adjust accordingly, as opposed to like, I need to fix her. Because I'm uncomfortable that she's not feeling, that she's not doing well, whatever well means for her. And then we live in a VUCA environment, volatile, uncertain, chaotic, ambiguous, and things are shifting all the time. Uh, and some directions not so good. And our question for these men is like, you know, if your community, your family, your community, your nation state, the world needs you to step up in a leadership position to deal with whatever the situations are, are you capable of doing it without like <clears throat> getting, you know, frozen in fear? Like, can you really stand up as a man and, and, and protect your family or your community or whatever it, it requires of you? So those are the kind of things we're doing in the men's group is like teaching men how to build that resilience in themselves. So they're much more capable of handling whatever the world throws at them, including their internal world. Yeah. Got it. So it sort of feels like it's a lot more around emotional resilience rather than like physiological resilience. It is. So like we still have our guys do challenges because we think that's really important. And if we go back to my four pillar program, physiological, psychological, social, and environmental, my basic intention is if you don't have your physiology dialed in, the psychological stuff is harder. So even if you want to become more emotionally resilient, but you're not sleeping well, you're not eating well, you're not living with the 24 hour night circadian cycles, you're not dealing with your stress well, you know, emotional resilience is going to be really hard to cultivate. But if you dial those things in, then it'll be easier, not easy, but easier, including mental toughness, emotional resiliency, you know, but those kind of things. Yeah. I've heard that a, a number of times you like start with, like exercise helps with your mental state in a big way. So I, I totally see what you're saying. Yeah. And I know that's big for you, Anthony. I mean, you're, you're a fitness dude. So you yeah. get it. You get that. Yeah. Yeah. It's made a big change that plus that plus the shift off alcohol, right? Like stop, stop drinking. And then life became so much easier. Yeah. Find your spirits elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Bottle. Yeah. I like that a lot. <laughs> Yeah. So both of you are non-drinkers. Is that what I'm hearing? Or minimal right. drinkers? Okay. Yep. Nope. No, zero yeah. alcohol for three and a half years for me. And Anthony, you just passed five, correct? That's right. Wow. Good on you guys. Yeah. I, someone's... I, I... Yeah. Please. Uh, but... I was going to say a friend, a friend of ours said that it was like taking the ankle weights off. Like quit drinking is just, everything just gets a little bit easier. And then, you know, over the time it's compounded. So now things are, you know, measurably different. But it took time to get here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's awesome that you had the discipline to do so. Both of you guys. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm a teetotaler for the most part. I might have a drink once a year. Like a friend of mine passed away last year. We celebrated his life, that kind of stuff. But I've, I've probably, probably about 30 years or so, 28 years, been a, mostly a teetotaler. And I find the same same benefits. Like, yeah. I, you know, I sleep better, uh, I have more energy, you know, cognition is better. Yeah, maybe I'm a little less fun, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before too. <laughs> yeah, so here's here's what I find, and I, and I talk about my four-pillar program. People are capable, and, and I learned this from Commander Mark Devine at SealFit. I worked for Seal, I worked for Mark for over a decade. And he's, he talks about 20Xing your performance, your Cable of 20 times more than you think you are. I, I completely agree with it. And we joked before we got online, oh, it used to be 10X, now it's 20X, but like, it could be like 50X. Like, you know, our, our, how we think of, conceive of ourselves and what our culture allows us to imagine is really small compared to what's possible for us. So that's like my starting point. And then I look into the four pillars that I kind of mentioned earlier. And if you really want a 20X perform, performance, you first have to, in, in parallel with, dial in your physiology. Like, you know, I've already said this, if you're not sleeping well, you're not eating well, you're not moving, you're not getting fitness, you're not dealing with stress, you're not living in the 24 hour night, day night cycles. Yeah, you can kind of force your way to 20X, but there's gonna be consequences down the road towards forming your human system. You'll be burning, the burning candle at both ends, I guess is how they'd say. So first of all, if you, hey, if you really want a 20X your performance, dial in your physiology. You know, hey, quit, maybe quit drinking or reduce your alcohol consumption. 
get some good sleep, deep sleep, and deep REM, you know, REM sleep and deep sleep, the quantity you, that is going to be beneficial for you, sleep like that every day as much as possible. Fitness and movement. I make a distinction between fitness and movement. Like fitness is, I go to the gym and I lift weights, or I do CrossFit, or I do Seal Fit, I do Bar Ray, you know, whatever it is. Like particular exercise or particular prescribed period of time. Cool. Everyone should do something like that almost every day or whatever their, their you know their life goals are. And then movement is different. Like we to have a tendency to be sitting here on our computers all day long. And uh, you know, I, I hear that that's less the new smoking. You know, something along those lines. So we, we, what I encourage all my clients to do, and I do this myself, is like, okay, choose a period of time that you're going to be doing the intense work. Base it on what you're capable of doing before you kind of get distracted and, and, and like get you know, uh, kind of ADD-ish or whatever. And then take breaks. And the breaks could be I do some Tai Chi, I do some Qi Gong, I do some yoga, I walk around the block. It just like literally physically move the body on a daily basis. And the same is true first thing in the morning. I encourage my clients to get up with the sun. I like Huberman, like watch the sunrise, go for a walk, walk after you each of the meals. It helps with insulin, you know, all, all that kind of, there's so much benefits of just moving. I think we're designed to move <laughs> like as human beings. So like dial that in. So there's things you can do on the physical side, you know, on the movement side, on the, on the diet and nutrition side, stress management, like how do you deal with your stress? And I, I like to talk about the good, the bad, the ugly. We'll go with the really ugly first. It's like, hey, I'm really stressed, and I and I do like a drink a six pack of beer, or a gallon of vodka, or you know, I, I watch porn all night long. Whatever, it, like, like, not really healthy. It's not really healthy. It's not conducive to a thriving life. But you know, people do that, and so that's like the ugly. And the bad would be like some version of that, but a little less. So maybe I just drink alcohol or smoke marijuana or whatever it is, not to get really fucking drunk as a motherfucker, but like just to redu reduce the stress a little bit, you know, or I watch, I get lost in Netflix or whatever it is. The good be like, oh, what can I learn to do to manage my nervous system in, in, in the midst of whatever the event is that I'm reacting to in a stressful way? Breath practices, some yoga, mindset work, all those things are, oh, you go for a run, exercise, whatever it happens to be. Now I say that's good, but, but another way to consider it too is you're learning to manage your nervous system in a perceived stressful environment you can also think about two other things too. Like, can I change the environment or the situation? Can't always, but like, maybe you can, maybe there, you can be, you know, there's something you can do to take action, to change the situation. So it's no longer stressful for you or perceived to be stressful. Cool. So you change the situation or you manage yourself, or you can change your mindset. And this is a 20 X thing. And, and I love this. I had a client who traveled for work three or three weeks out of four every, every month. He was a fun, he was doing fundraising for his nonprofit. And after a while, he's like burned out, which makes sense. He's like, he wants to be on the road three or four weeks a, a year, or three or four weeks a month. And so we were working on this, like, and he still had to do it. He had to do it because he loved his job. He wanted to keep his job. He's going to continue doing his job. I said, can we change your mindset? So instead of like a drag, like, oh God, I got to do another trip. Can you have an adventure mindset? Can you look at each opportunity when you go to a new place as an adventure? And, you know, it's not like media like that, but he actually switched his mindset. And he, he made it fun. Like instead of doing every every fundraising dinner over a fundraising conversation over a dinner at a fancy restaurant with lots of alcohol, he, he did a walk in the park with one with one potential donor. He went to yoga with another potential donor. You know, he just started switching up his mindset. Like, what's possible? Why do why do I have to live in the within this framework of what we're supposed to do? And it became much more interesting for him and much more adventuresome. And he actually raised more money, which is awesome too. And he also is like, maybe I can go to these, some of these places couple hours early or a day early and explore like instead of flying in meeting and flying out like I can make this really an adventure and meet new people and have new experiences and stuff like that so you know that ex extended his capabilities of, of living within this job tremendously it made it more fun for him raised more money for his organization which is wonderful so you know those are some of the things you can think about in terms of like stress management like manage yourself change the situation or change your mindset to the whole situation it's no longer stressful it's an adventure and that changes the dynamic. So like on the physiological side, let's dial all those things in. And once you do, or as you do, you you will notice the energy increases, your capacity increases, you're then able to take on the world in a different way. And then we can talk about the psychological, social, and environmental if you'd like to. Yeah, but let's do it. Okay, cool. And the psychological, I divide it into cognitive, emotional, uh, somatic, energetic, and spiritual. 
So cognitive is like the scripts we have in our head, how we talk to ourselves, how we talk to other people, our tone, our volume. And it's really important because if I walk around going, I can't, I shouldn't, I won't, I suck, I'm a loser, you know, whatever the internal dialogue is, I'm not going to be 20 x shit if I'm walking around that mindset. And if that's my mindset that articulates to other people, then I'm also doing the same thing to other people. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm working to, in the cultural sense, limit their cap- capacities to expand their lives too. You know, so like, oh, start noticing how you talk yourself, how you talk to other people, the language you use, the tone, and volume. And let's switch it up. Let's go from like, like I can't to I, 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 I am, I'm capable. Or and even if you're not capable in terms of having the abilities, have the confidence and then develop the capacities, develop the skill set, do what you need to do to make sure it happens. You know, but don't just walk around going, oh, what well, was me? Or I'm a victim, or I suck, or whatever it is. So that's the cognitive. On the emotional side. Um, we as human beings usually have a certain subset of emotions which we were taught in our family of origin are haram or no good or we shouldn't possess or we shouldn't feel like you know i'll give you something to cry about oh shit i better not cry in my family of origin or life is hard there's nothing to be happy about you better you shouldn't be walking around happy there's nothing to be joyful about it. Oh, shit. anger you can't have anger in this family you know so there's various emotions that we're taught to not only repress but not you know, like to not feel but repress and my work with my clients is like, no, if you, you know, you want to have the full range of all the emotions and the full capacity to experience all the emotions. It doesn't mean you have to express them every single moment of every single day, but at least being aware of them and learn to manage them to its higher ends is what we do. And that actually frees up so much energy. It's really fascinating as you kind of expand yourself and be capable of feeling more emotions and the depths of emotions, you have more energy, which allows you to 20 X your, your performance is like, yeah, you're not like using the energy to contract against a certain feeling so let me just that's cognitive and emotional before i get into energetic and somatic and spiritual let me just see if you guys have any questions on that it all makes a lot of sense uh especially the especially the um the cognitive piece i know that i have spoken with uh my therapist a lot about kind of changing or challenging certain internal statements you have where you're talking about like, you know, playing a victim or uh, this thing's happening to me because like, of course it does, right? Like, why is this always happening to me sort of thing? And just being able to challenge those statements in your in your head and reframe it into a, a different way has at least helped me definitely be able to overcome a lot of the uh, the blockers that I've had in my own life. So a lot of that resonated very much. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, Jason. Like, like just we pay attention to how we speak to ourselves and it limits us in the case where you're speaking of like, Oh, I, I don't have to limit myself anymore. I can change how I think about things. Yeah. It's powerful. All right, cool. So that's the uh, cognitive and emotional, uh, the somatic I'm trained as a somatic psychotherapist. So the body is really important to me and like how we actually live inside of our bodies. And most therapy slash coaching is like between the years, like how you think about stuff and nothing like, I think that's important too, but like, is uh, we shouldn't limit ourselves to that because we're embodied beings. And so what I will work with clients on is, for instance, breath. You know, there's a lot of, breath has actually become really kind of popular these days you know, as a means of managing the nervous system or expanding consciousness, depending on what the breath practices are, relaxing the system. So I, I will work with clients on learning to manage themselves through their breathing practices. And that's also another way of 20 xing your performance because like if your energy is low, you can increase it. If your energy is too high and you get a little anxious, you can bring it back down. If you're contracted in your thinking and you want to expand your thinking, there's exercises for that too. So you're literally like you can use breath to 20 extra performance. And I would like to throw this in there too. Like a concept I came up with at, at Seal Fit was negative 20 X. 20 X in your performance is wonderful. I think it's really important. There are some people, and you probably encounter them in your all's work, that you know, type AAA personalities. The last thing they knew they need for their health is a 20 X or try triple A personality. Like maybe they need to learn to settle down, relax, be calm, cool, and collected. So I, I had clients who were like, well, I'm going to do a tough mutter. Then I'm going to do a Spartan race. I'm going to do Kokoro camp. Then I'm going to do a Ironman. I'm like, why don't you sit your ass down for 30 days and do nothing and breathe for five minutes every day? No, I'd rather go do all these other things. Like, okay, no, cool. That's why I think you should just sit still for five minutes every day for a month not train up for something and just sit with yourself. So the negative 20 X is also as important for some relax, calm down, sit with yourself, see what's going on, not running to the next thing. Cause you're distracting yourself from the thing behind you. 
So yeah, I just want to throw that in there that I think that's important. But so somatically, like okay, breathing, breathing and posture, muscle tone. I work with clients and and I'll be like, you know, they'll say I'm angry. I'm like, how do you know you're angry? I'm angry. Okay, I'm playing. I'll play, play dumb. I don't. What do you mean by I'm angry? And they'll sit for a couple minutes. Like, well, um, here's how I experience anger: tightness in the jaws. Cool. Okay, that's good. Good self awareness. I hold my breath. My heart beats going a little faster. So I help them become aware of like how they do what they do in terms of emotions or thought thinking patterns that shows up in the physical body. Because once you're aware of that, then you can reprogram it for something else. But if you don't know how you do what you do, you can't really reprogram it for something else. So I work a lot of somatic stuff. Yeah. One one quick question. I was going to ask, what are some of your favorite breathwork programs? I know there's a lot of them, and I'm not sure which ones like to to follow. Well, so here's what's. I'm going to be the most boring answer. I'm going to give you the most boring answer to that question. The one that I do for all my clients, including couples and individuals, every time we start a session is an easy five count inhale, no hold, five count exhale, no hold on the bottom. Literally that. Practice that. If you can practice that and you can manage your nervous system, kind of get yourself in a calm, cool, centered place, that's awesome. I would just start there. And if you want to get a little bit more complex, the Mark Divine talks about box breathing, you know, four count, four count, four count, four count, or five, 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 a little bit more complex. But I would say just doing the five, five for a lot of people is hard. <laughs> so just practice that. And then at another time we can talk about, okay, cool. You, you manage your nervous system. You're a little bit calmer. Here's what you can do to increase your energy. Here's what you can do to decrease your energy. Here's what you can do to expand your consciousness. You know, like whole trauma of breath work. Okay. That's cool for you. You know, want to get into the transpersonal states through breath work, but just for basics, it's five, 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 five. Yep, makes sense. And I imagine like many, many, many people have Apple watches. Like, just put your heart rate monitor on and breathe five count in and out, and just see what it does to your heart rate. Perfect. Yeah, or a Garmin or or ring and all those cool <laughs> devices that we have. Yep, exactly. Yep. So energetics is really important to me, like the energy of the of the body, and and I will say to clients, all things being equal, do you know your energetic patterns in any particular day, week, month? season or year and most people don't and what i mean by that is like because they do exogenous chemicals in the morning they do their caffeine disrupts their own natural energy system to wake them up people take sleeping pills or marijuana at night bring themselves down there's artificial light there's a lot of things we exogenously use in our environment that disrupts our own energy system and then we're always making up for it okay i need more caffeine i need more nicotine i need whatever it is to sleep if if you can go out for a, a week in nature and just get into the 24-hour day-night cycle without any exogenous chemicals, without any natu unnatural light, and find out what your natural rhythms are, I think that's a great baseline. And then just watch yourself after that to determine, like, what is the best time of any particular day that I can do certain tasks? Like, when do I, when do I work out the best? When do I do rote learning? When do I do creative learning? When do I do... Uh, social interactions are best. And you now we have obligations, we have families, but if you can know how you do things on a daily, weekly, quarterly basis better than not, then you can organize your life somewhat around those things within the limitations of the obligations you have. And then recognizing too that when you stretch your system beyond its normal capacity, there's a recovery time that's necessary. You know, so if you're a biohacker and you're like, man, I need to, I need to work on this project and I, I can usually pay attention for like 90 minutes but I'm going to buy, hack my way into eight hours of intense focus, like one of the modafinil or one of the other biohacking drugs you can buy. Cool. Okay. Just realize there's consequences to the brain nervous system that you have to have recovery on the other side, or you're just going to keep pushing it and then burn the system out. So get to know your energetic system, organize accordingly, and then adapt to any extended use of a particular type of system within your, within your body for recovery purposes. That's kind of my approach to energetics. And that just allows you to really 20 extra performance because you're living within your own energetic dynamic in a healthy way. That reminded me of the book, The 72-Hour Effect. It was like an audible thing. And they had people outside, the people who were like just all wound up from life. And then they were like, you need to spend three days in nature. And then they measured their like brain activity along the way. They gave them... Uh, cognitive tests along the way and they just saw how it changed over time it was really fascinating i like the book a lot uh, i will definitely check it out thank you anthony and you know i'd love to hear from you guys here in like six months how, how the week went if you guys decide to do it yeah anthony let's you and i plan a week <laughs>
I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so spirituality has like two definitions for me. One is values. You know, so I'll ask my clients, what are your values? And they'll say X, Y, and Z. And I'll say, all right, so walk me through the behaviors which would indicate to you that you're living into your values. And I find that for a lot of people, there's a misalignment. They'll, they'll claim one thing, this is the values I have or the principles that guide my life or whatever it is, but their behaviors don't mat, uh, match the, the, you know, that claim. So I'm like, okay, let's either look at your, let's both these things, look at your values. Maybe they're socially constructed, not from like an innate sense of self, but they're given to you from other people and your culture and religion and ethnicity and nationality, whatever, which is fine, but like not necessarily yours, okay? And or let's look at your behaviors. So there, so you choose values that are important to you, and, and and let's find the behaviors that align with them and keep you accountable to that. So I work with couples, and you know, for instance, I had a, a couple not too long ago, and, and the guys like, you know, I want to be more present with my wife. Cool, and I play Inspector Clouseau. I'm like, oh, what do you mean by present? I don't understand, you know. And he's like, well, I, I just want to be present when I talk to her. I'm like, okay, that's very abstract. I need really concrete behaviors that indicate to you that you're actually being present. So he came up with like three or four of them. One is eye contact. You look at his wife in the eye when he's talking to her. Others, no phone. He's not going to be on his phone, even not looking at it on his, you know, so he's literally looking at her without his phone in his hand. And he came up with two or three other ones. So, okay, cool. Now we have something to assess whether you're living through that value of yours. See, it's really an important value. And not only can I ask him and, you know, people can, F around sometimes. I am. I'm doing that. But like, okay, let's talk to your wife. And his wife was like, yeah, okay, he's still on his phone. He's not giving me eye contact. And he's having like 500 different conversations while he's talking to me. Cool. Okay. So the, obviously presence is not really a high value for you. Or if it is, you're not living into that. So what do we need to adjust inside of you so you can actually live through that value? So the values are really important to me for my work with clients and make sure they, they embody those values. So that's one piece a spirituality and part of that too is your why why are you here why do you think you're here on planet earth what drives you what's your purpose you know those kind of things are important too kind of in the value space and then i'd say um another part of spirit there's other two other parts of spirituality for me you know i might want to tell you what to believe but if you come to me with a belief system and i, I you know for instance i have uh, some greek orthodox clients and i have some catholic clients so like, how can I support you if that's important to you to explore that part of your life? What are the disciplines and practices that you need to inculcate in your life to be more spiritual in a religious sense? And we talk about that and I can hold them to, I can help them be held accountable to that. You know, I have a client who wakes up every morning and, and he's Greek Orthodox and there's certain, and it, I learned so much. It's like the, the, the fathers from that tradition have written some amazing books and he reads it every day. And he prays and he meditates. So, like, I just check in. You know, how how's that practice going for you? Awesome. And I'm not gonna, I'm not here to tell him. Well, no, Jesus is not right. You should be a Buddhist, or you know, like that's not my thing. But like, whatever your thing is, one of the things I find is helpful to support you on that path if it's important to you. And that can 20x your performance. Like, if you like, if you happen to be a theist and you believe in God, and God's on your side. That's pretty powerful. Pretty, pretty powerful to get you, help you get through things. Or whatever religious system belief might be, you can rely on that to help you through some really challenging times. So that's a second piece of three when it comes to spirituality. And I imagine that, yeah, I imagine that that also shows up as a value, right? Like the the religious teachings, you know, you were saying that some of those values come from social constructs, but also some of those are real to you. You know, you believe that stuff or else you, would, you wouldn't go there in the first place. And so being able to kind of hit both of those things at the same time, uh, that makes sense to me. Yeah, I completely, completely agree. And, you know, it's not just because something is socially constructed from the external world, like a religious system or your family of origin doesn't mean it's bad. You know, it could serve you really well. The question is, like, just be aware of it. Ask the questions. Is this really what I believe? And if it is, cool, okay, then see your behaviors to indicate that it's actually a real belief you have. Um, and then the last piece on spirituality is kind of like what I would call evolution of consciousness. You know, there's, there's certain models and maps out there that, that I, I understand and I've studied that consciousness can evolve over time um, or lines of, or certain lines can evolve over time. And I'm very interested in that. What, what conditions can I help create in the client to help them evolve themselves to higher levels of function? 
whether morally or ethically or, or ethical, same thing, or emotionally or cognitively or spiritually, whatever it happens to be, growth is always possible. And there's so many different tools out there, whether it's meditation or yoga or psychedelics or, or prayer or sensory deprivation tanks, or, you know, there's a lot of different things we can do to expand and grow our consciousness in certain lines. That's also an area that I think is important to explore. And all of these are part of your one-on-one -on -one coaching program? Yeah, it is. Yeah. We, and we haven't even got to the social and environmental, but it's, all, it's a very pretty comprehensive program. It's a six month program. And I, and I like the joke and actually, I think Anthony, you and I talked about this offline is like, I will, I will try to convince clients not to join my program because I don't want them to show up going, I'm excited to join your program, but I don't want to do the work. I'm like, no, you're going to do a lot of effing work if you really want to grow and do my program. So just be aware of that and make good decisions. <laughs> right. Increase sign up friction because you know they're <laughs> yeah. serious if they get through it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, as a marriage and family therapist, I'm a systems thinker. That's just kind of natural to me. And I, and I think about social ecologies or social systems we're embedded in family and work and community and things like that. And I find it really important for people to be mindful of the communities they're part of, whether it's a family or a workspace or whatever communities, and to seek communities that support your growth and development and where you also support the growth and development of other people within the community. And I'll talk about communities of practice. So I, I might have a client say to me, you know, I don't really have a physical training community. Okay, let's, let's explore what that might look like. And they might say, CrossFit. Well, CrossFit is actually organized in most cases as a community. Like, if you don't show up, they call you. Hey, hey, John, where the hell were you? I missed you at the training yesterday. Or like you're doing your last set and they slap you in the butt, I mean, you know, depending who you are, and like, good job, you know, all that kind of good stuff. So it's, like, it's really physical training is community oriented. It's like, that's awesome. Let's find your community where you're going to be supported and grow and develop and you can support other people. But it could also be like uh, uh, someone's like, I, you know, I, I want more intimacy in my life. I don't have the capacity necessarily to be really intimate with another human being. Let's find you an intimacy group of, of both genders where we get together and explore topics and experiences and stuff like that. Cool. That's a community of practice. You get to actually practice being vulnerable in front of a group of people who start out as strangers and hopefully they become friends over the long haul. Or you might be like, okay, I need a spiritual community. Is there a church, a synagogue, a temple you want to go to, a mosque? Cool. And or like secular spirituality or, you know, or you know, join a meditation group or a yoga community. But it has to be a, com a community, not just like eight people get together and they meditate and they don't talk to each other and they just go on their own ways. It's more like we're here to support one another. It's literally a community. So I, I help them find and expand upon the communities that they exist in or they want to expand into. And then I ask questions about the present day communities, like your family. If I'm working with a husband, does your wife support your growth? If you're working with a wife, does your husband support your growth? If they don't, that's hard. Like to have someone in your life that you see every day, like is afraid of maybe, I don't know if the, the dynamic behind the person, like afraid of you growing, but doesn't want you to grow and will quash it at every opportunity they have. Okay, we need to change that dynamic. We need to help the other person realize that your growth is a good thing for you and them and for the family. And how can we help them support you and your growth? And how can you help support them in their particular growth? So I work, I work with anyone and everyone as part of your community to help expand yourself and, and grow and develop. And I also have a team behind me like, hey, if you need a physical trainer or you need a functional medicine doctor or you need a nutritionist, like, hey, I, I, I got people to support you in certain areas of your life. It all makes a ton of sense. Like having people to support you and hold you accountable for, uh, for your own progress uh, and all that makes a ton of sense. Uh, I've experienced that in my own life and uh, definitely encourage everyone out there to also, like you say, find a, a group that supports you and that uh, is helping you get to where you want to be. Amen. And it, and it could be a therapist. It could be a coach. I mean, that's not a group, but still you could find someone in your life to hold you accountable and support your growth and development. But hopefully, ultimately, it's like your spouse does that and your best buddy does that and your workmates do that. You know, they, they care enough about you and they're not so protective of their own identity around who you should be that they're able to support you in your growth and development. That's ultimately the key. Uh, and then the last piece is, is the environmental. And environmental has two pieces for me. One is your home office and transportation. Does it support behavior changes that you're seeking or is it detracting behavior changes? So funny examples like 
if, if you know, Jason's like came to your house, you're like, man, I'm trying to get off sugar. I'm like, cool. Right. So you took me to your home office and you look at your desk. And there's a bowl of M and M's. I'm like, all right, so you're spending your time trying not to eat the bowl of M and M's in front of you. Okay, that's not the best use of real PowerPoints. So it'd be like via negativa. Maybe we need to remove the M and M's from your desk, <laughs> so you're not, so you're not trying not to eat them. You know, so there's there's ways of removing things from your environment to support behavior changes, and there are ways of adding things to your environment. And my one of my favorite examples is I had a client who was training up for Coke World Campus, Silfed, which is not after Hell Week. And he had, we have to do a lot of pull-ups for, for Coke Row Camp. And uh, he was kind of weak on the pull-up stuff. And so I said, well, why don't you buy a pull-up bar and put it in your home office, like in the doorway. And every time you pass underneath it, going to the bathroom, getting lunch, getting your coffee, whatever you're walking the dogs, whatever you do, you have to do a handful of pull-ups. So by the end of the day, he's doing like 20 to 30 pull-ups because he just keeps going back and forth to do, to do stuff, which he wouldn't have done normally, you know, because he's working. But like, so you got those extra in. So there's a way of adding things to your environment to support particular behavior changes or ways of being in the world. So that's, that's the via negativa, removing things, via positiva, adding things. And then look, actually looking at your environment is a conducive to health, meaning like what cleaning supplies do you use? Makeup, cosmetics, hair supplies, soaps, laundry detergent, your carpets, like, you know, the kind of lights you have in your home. All those things have effects on your human system. The more you know, the better decisions you can take to either re- remove those things which are detrimental to your health or add things in which can contribute to your health. So I start to have clients kind of thinking along those lines too. Because, you know, if you're eating well, you're exercising, you're doing great stuff, but then you're using supplies in your home that are like carcinogenic or neurotoxic, that's not so good. <laughs> like, so I want them to th- start thinking holistically as best as possible with the constraints we have within our society because, you know, we're surrounded by all kinds of environmental toxins unfortunately all the time. Yeah, that resonates with me a lot, mostly because I'm in the process of trying to change my environment to like optimize it for my health. And I'm realizing how difficult it is to do. Like, I'm just trying to find, um, like I was thinking about like, uh, sorry, I've got so many different things I could talk about here. But as a simple example, like I've just started putting growing food in my backyard because I'm like, I just don't know what I'm getting from the grocery store, right? And that's step one. And then I started thinking about water. And then I started thinking about the cleaning supplies, like you mentioned. And then I started thinking about like my, my workout systems in the gym and like the community and trying to figure that out. And it's, it's a lot of work. That's why I convinced clients not to join in working with me. (laughs) That's a lot of work. It is. (laughs) So I really appreciate what you're doing. If you can help guide people, so yeah. that it's like me trying to figure this out for myself is extra work. Cause like, I don't know what the answers are and like, at least presumably you'll have some of the answers and be like, Hey, well, you know, pick this instead of that for these reasons. And in my case, I'm like, Oh, do I want to pick this or this or this? Right now? <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, good on you for exploring your options and, and seeking better health. That's all. I mean, Anthony, that's awesome. As challenging as it is. Cause you know, we live in a society where the opposite is true. Like if we're sold a bunch of goods on all kinds of crap that's detrimental to us. And every institution we engage with, whether it's medicine or education or food, whatever it is, is like, oh, my God. Talking about being anti-human and anti-human health. Yeah. So yeah. good on you for challenging the dominant paradigm. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Like even the lighting, right? Like one of the things I yeah, noticed yeah. is that my lights, my LED lights are on full blast at 8 o'clock at night. And no wonder the kids have trouble going to sleep, right? Yeah. And then I was like, okay, well, if I want to make it so that we kind of bring the energy in the house down as we get towards the evening. Like it's, it takes intention. I have to remember to go and hit the dimmers in every room and all that, or get the kids out. One, one thing I did do last week that I thought was a huge hit for the family was after dinner. I was like, it's about 45 minutes before bedtime, but the stunt is still out because we're in the, oh, peak, right. you know, we're about to hit summer. It's like, kids, let's go for a walk. Let's just go for a walk. And nice. that way we get to like, nice calm down and watch the sun slowly set and watch the sky slowly darken. And it made getting ready for bed a whole lot easier. That's awesome. I love the explore, uh, the, the kind of playing around experiment. That's cool. So I wanted to ask, we, we sort of covered in the beginning that the physiological pillar of those four is sort of the most important one. You got to get that sorted out before any of the other stuff can really have any effect on you. 
once you've gotten your physiological pillar sorted out or in a place that you feel like it's in a good place, is there a natural next step or are the, are the other pillars sort of all kind of at the same level and you can take on whichever one you feel like is the most deficient for you at the time? So that's a great question, Jason. And I'll tell you, although I kind of highlighted the need to dial in your physiology first, I do all of them at the same time to a certain extent. Um, for, so for the program, we actually co-create a training plan for the six month period of time, which highlights the areas of interest that you only really want to work on. And we cover all four, but we're not going to cover everything in depth for all four things. You know, you got to prioritize because we have lives and stuff like that. So yeah, there's a lot of work, but I, I'm also a human being and I don't want to overwhelm me with too much stuff. So it really depends on the individual, what, what their priorities are. And I'll, I will watch over time and if like there's one area that they're kind of deprioritizing that I think is important to them, I'll ask lots of questions. I'm curious on why that would be less important to them. And then might raise it over time. But I would say all four are generally important to be, be aware of at the same time. So just wrapping up here, um, how, let's, let's uh, plug you, your website, how people get a hold of you, just that sort of thing. Sweet. Thanks, Anthony. So um, website is Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, the letter D as in David, Osterlink, O-S-T-R-O-L-E-N-K.com. And you can get a hold of me there. It talks about my work. Uh, I spend way too much time on Instagram. You can find me there. M Osterlink, M-O-S-T-R-O-L-E-N-K. I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook as well. Put my full name. Any of those platforms. I also have a TikTok account, but I don't actually do TikTok. I don't have it on my phone. I, I spent a good amount of time in kind of the national security space for a while. And I have just concerns about TikTok. I have concerns for all the platforms. But I'm on I'm on TikTok, but I don't actually don't run my own account. My, a colleague of mine does. So you can find me there, but you really can't find me there. I'm literally on the other ones though. <laughs> Got it. And we'll put all that stuff in the in the show notes so it'll be easy to find you. Nice. Thanks, Anthony. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Well, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time today. It's been a fantastic conversation. Very, uh, very informational. There's a lot of good stuff out there uh, that you've given us. So thank you so much again for taking the time. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, and I'm really happy to meet people who are actively uh, trying to make a dent in all of the systems that are not designed for our well-being. So <laughs> yes. good on you. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. You got to do what you can do. That's right. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you again. And until next time, everybody, be well.